Hello, my name is Stanford Gibson. I'm the Sediment Transport Specialist at HEC. And a couple of months ago, Alex Sanchez and I taught the first ever Sediment Transport 2D class in RAS at HEC. And we recorded the classes and we are editing them. And by the release of 6.2, we hope to have them up on the HEC website. But before then, we had some interest in this first talk. This first talk kind of just kind of walks through six different applications that we've done with 2D Sediment in HEC RAS three laboratory scale and three prototype scale projects. And so if you're interested in kind of what we've been doing with the program and what sorts of applications um, we've already done, uh, this gives you a kind of an overview of some modeling process and some of the things that the model can do. I will update the notes of this lecture when the full class is released over on the HEC website. We're going to talk these kind of six stories about how we've used the model that kind of highlight different aspects of the model. Um, the first is the uh, Weiss flume experiment. Now, this is an experiment that th this is actually going to be your workshop. You're going to build this model this afternoon. Um, and this is a classic model. Uh, basically, it's an expansion contraction flume. They, uh, they have a flume that um, has a, a run up and then it con contracts, runs fast and um, narrow for a while, and then expands. And so what's the hypothesis? What's going to happen here? Scour. You're going to scour. And then what's going to happen here? It's going to give it back, right? That's exactly what happens. Um, and so uh, you know, here are the hydrodynamics. Alex did, Alex did this work. Um, he, uh, you've got um, higher velocities through the, uh, through the channel. And so then here's your concentration, your transport capacity, and your bed change. Um, the color scheme here is pretty common for what we use for bed change. Um, red is going to be erosion, blue is going to be deposition, and we make it symmetrical so that zero turns out to be white. Um, and it, you, that's exactly right. You've got er erosion in the main channel, and deposition basically gives it back during the expansion. And uh, this is the, uh, the calibration he did. So basically, we're looking at um, a transect through the flume, a longitudinal transect. And here is the water surface elevation. You actually have a dip during the tr contraction, um, and then the bed change. You get your erosion through the contraction, and then we give it back. And we, we give it back a little bit, a little bit early, um, but we give it back at approximately the same magnitude. And the reason is because the water surface is overpredicted at the expansion over there. And so it slows down quicker than it should, and then the sediment drops out quicker than it should. So that's more of a hydraulic issue than which is kind of will illustrate a point that we're going to hit a lot of times here is that you know sediment transport is a magnifying glass on your hydraulics. Uh, hyd the hydraulic equations are they're very forgiving. They're self-correcting equations. Um, but once you put sediment, so you can actually have a pretty bad model that gives pretty good results. Um, you can have a model that gives good results for the wrong reasons. But once you start putting sediment in there. Um, it becomes very sensitive to lots of things and it exposes issues with the hydraulics. All right, second is we have this floodplain deposition flume. This is a flume that was, uh, it was run in Germany uh, they, at uh, one of the hydraulic labs in Germany. And what they did is they're actually looking at the role of vegetation on you know, natural levee formation. And so they ran this flume basically with this astroturf and uh, they ran it at capacity in the main channel. They ran it with plastic and with sediment. And so the plastic has a specific gravity of 1.3, which we can't do yet in 1D, but we can do in 2D. You can put in different specific gravity materials, which is really helpful if you want to do, say, you know, metals or contaminants or something like that. Um, so we put in a, a grain class of 1.3 and uh, modeled both. And the idea is here we want to build natural levees. And so uh, they actually got, had some deposition on the side and uh, have, so, have some measurement of the different gradations. You would expect, would you expect coarser or finer material to deposit on the overbank versus the channel? Finer in the overbank, and that's what they found. And so this is a pretty good calibration data. And uh, first of all, just uh, this, I think this is my only 1D slide in the, in the whole class, but uh, the John and I worked on this last year. Um, we've added new overbank deposition um, algorithms to RAS. This is actually a simple one. We added a much more complicated one that is, actually, that is going to be in the 6.2 release. And so it used to be that you, know, you couldn't do anything in 1D. Um, in 1, 1D, this would just be a total catastrophe. Anytime you have ma major overbank deposition, we're doing a lot better with that now in 1D. 
uh, and so we did this in 1D, but then we also did this in 2D. And so here's what you're looking at. We have our 2D mesh, um, and then this is our 2D terrain. And this is the simulated and the observed data. And these are on similar orders of magnitude. And so you've got your, you know, your channel is at capacity. The channel is uh, supply limited, and so it's transporting everything you put in it. But the overbank, you've got some, you've got deposition, and, you, and we're getting deposition to approximately the right magnitude. And uh, this is a different one where, you, where the uh, channel isn't supply limited, but uh, I've got a little video here. And so what you're seeing here is the deposition along this transect. And so you can see the, the brown is the thickness of the deposition. And so you're getting deposition in the channel. But also, here's the deposition in the channel versus the deposition in the overbank. And you can see the differential deposition that's going on there. Again, the, the deposition in the overbank is approximately the same magnitude as uh, what we see in the experiment. And in this case, because it's all deposition, I have, there's no erosion. I didn't do it in a red-blue scale. I just did it in you know, intensity of brown because sediment is brown in my imagination. Last year, we added the uh, ability to do non-Newtonian flow with uh, 2D sediment. Um, this was a, a laboratory uh, experiment that was done at, uh, in, in France. Um, it's basically instantaneous uh, you know, gate opening with over a mobile bed uh, with the median grain size of 1.7 millimeters. It had a 10 centimeter thickness of uh, sediment and then concrete underneath. Um, and obviously, because it, it was a dam break, it, it had um, pretty high concentrations and pretty high velocities. Um, it was um, well-graded sediment, so we used this, a single, I used a single grain class, but you are able to use multiple grain classes. Um, I used uh, the Wu transport f uh, potential formula and hindered settling by Richardson and Zaki. These are uh, images of, of the dam break during the experiment. This is right after the, the gate opened. And you see the, 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 the flow already carrying some sediment. And it, after it, it, it expands and it hits the wall, bounces back, and there's a little bit of recirculation on, on the side next to the, the gate. And so here you see a little bit of, of deposition from the, the expansion of that flow, some deposition up here. Um, and scour, obviously, where the, the gate used to be, the gate was positioned. Um, these are water levels at different points um, in the, the flume. And in general, we did a pretty good job of, uh, of reproducing the water levels. As far as like the non Newtonian parameters, I think I used a, a, a Bingham plastic for this one, um, and, and calibrated that one. But sediment is. Uh, much harder, and reproducing the bed elevations is much harder, but we, we still did a pretty good job of, these are cross-sections of the, the flume at different locations, but we did a pretty good job. I think that the mesh I used was a little bit coarse. I, um, I always start with the coarse mesh, and that's something we'll teach here. And I, I maybe I should have, you know, done another iteration with the smaller mesh, but um, I was happy with the results. This uh, next... Uh, data set is a um, surface runoff data set. So it's a small experimental watershed in Arizona. Uh, the, uh, it's a USDA experimental watershed. A very small watershed, it's only one acre. And uh, it's sandy loam material. I used the, the time series from this precipitation gauge that's inside the watershed uh, for precip. And then I compared flows and sediment loads at the outlet, which is down here. So this is a precipitation time series. It's a very short event. You can see it's only a few minutes long. But the intensity is super high, uh, about seven inches per hour. So very uh, intense uh, event, even though it was really short. Um, I use a yelling transport potential formula, which is not in the UI, but hopefully we can add that maybe later in the future. Um, and it's mixed cohesive, non-cohesive, so that, that, that makes it a very interesting data set. Um, and this is the grain size dis distribution here. So this is a snapshot of the sediment concentrations during the simulation. Here you see the, the, the hydrograph at the outlet, and this is the sediment load, the cumulative sediment load at the outlet. 
and I was surprised how well it did. Um, I, I would still like to do more testing on at this site to do a longer time period. Um, and at, at the time also, I don't think I, we were using infiltration in RAS. So I, I basically specified the excess as the boundary condition, but um, yeah, there's still more work to be done here. Although the, the, the current results are very promising. So the, the two takeaways from those two are, um, first of all, uh, we're not gonna talk about non-Newtonian again um, during this class, but RAS 6.0, did have non-Newtonian flow in it, the fixed bed non-Newtonian flow. And so we've done a lot of really cool stuff just with fixed bed non-Newtonian flow. What Alex has done is he's coupled our fixed bed non-Newtonian parameters with our sediment transport. So now we can do mobile bed non-Newtonian, which, uh, which is kind of a big deal. Um, and then the idea here is that, uh, you know, we think of RAS as a hydraulic model, but everything we're writing in 2D is going into HMS, like, um, like Jay said. So you can use it in HMS, but that goes the other way too. And so we can do yield in RAS, and there's erosion parameters in RAS because we can also do rainfall, and now we can do infiltration. Um, and so the idea is that in both of these models, we're getting to the place, since we're sharing all the code, where you can do all the things. Um, okay, next is, uh, is the model Alex and I put together, so I'm going to show you a lot of Alex's work. Um, I would have credited him even if he wasn't in the room. Um, and, uh, um, but this is the Chippewa. And the Chippewa, I learned, um, is, from, is in Wisconsin and it flows into the Mississippi River. The Mississippi River up in Alex's part of the world is a series of pools. Um, and so it comes in just downstream of Lake Pepin. And so because there, you know, this is a pool, we can pretty much assume a clear water boundary condition at Lake Pepin. But there is a pretty good sediment load coming into here. And so uh, the uh, St. Paul district spends quite a bit of money dredging at this confluence. Um, it's, a, it's a significant place of, uh, of effort for their district. Um, and so this was the model domain and uh, Alex and the USGS had done a, a pretty intensive uh, sediment, or sediment monitoring program. And so we had a lot of good data. And so this is the mesh. And uh, the thing that I want to show you about the mesh is a large part of my contribution to this project was just working on the mesh. Um, meshes don't happen like this by accident. Um, this takes a lot, of, a lot of work. Alex developed a roughness map. And so there's gonna be a couple of ways that you can bring roughness into RAS. Um, generally, you're gonna want some sort of shape file um, if it, you're not gonna have something general. And then we actually use this roughness, um, these roughnesses also to, I, to associate bed materials. And so we kind of made a, an assumption that you know, bed materials were going to associate with, um, with the different roughness areas um, so that we could spatially distribute our bed materials as well. And so um, one of the reasons I really wanted to show you this model is that John teaches the 1D sediment class with me. One of the things we stress in the 1D sediment class is just as critical, if not more here, is that you should not put sediment in the model until you have a strong calibrated hydraulic model. It is so tempting to have all of your data and so you just put it all in the model. You know where it goes, just put it in and then press compute and then see what happens. Don't do that. <laughs> That's going to be a catastrophe. You're going to move backwards. Um, build your hydraulic model first. Calibrate your hydraulic model and um, then add your sediment. And so that's what, uh, so one of the things that made this project um, really attractive to me is we already had a strong calibrated hydraulic model. And uh, this is a, you know, this looks like a 1D calibration, but that's because 2D calibration, it's still a little bit fuzzy. How you actually quantify and uh, communicate a 2D calibration, I've seen a lot of 2D calibrations. You've seen three of them already. Um, how do presenters usually present a 2D calibration? Either by one-dimensionalizing it, or by showing you two maps and saying, eh, that looks pretty good, right? And so, the, the, like, both of those are fine, um, but one-dimensionalizing it does make it a little bit more quantitative, like Alex did with the Weiss project. And so, what the other Alex did is he drew a transect down through um, the Chippewa into the Mississippi, and then they had observed data. And so, he could actually go in and look at the observed data. And then, of course, it's good to calibrate in space, but you also want to calibrate in time. And so he also had two gauges. 
And so then he went and he calibrated in time. And so that's a, that is a strong 2D hydraulic calibration because it's calibrated in space and in time. It's actually easy to calibrate in space and still get things wrong. Um, and so calibrating temporally adds another level of fidelity. Um, and then he, uh, he went one step further. He actually had, uh, the USGS had theoretical curves about flow splits. Um, there's a number of very problematic flow splits up here. And so the USGS had um, theoretical curves about the flow splits. And so he computed the actual percentage flow splits for the entire simulation and plotted them against the USGS the theoretical curves to show that actually my flow splits are right too, which is going to be incredibly important for getting the right amount of sediment into those. So this is actually not only an excellent calibrated model, it's kind of an above and beyond calibrated model, but it's calibrated for the question we're asking. This is one of the things that I'm not covering a lot in this class, but you know, one of the first things that I talk about when someone comes to me with a sediment model is, yeah, but what, what question are you asking? Because you don't build a sediment model as a like, you know, exer scientific exercise to simulate the system. You build a sediment model to answer some sort of management question. You know, we're, we're agency people or people who work for agency people. We're not professors. Um, we don't just create models because it's interesting. We are answering a question, so you have to build your model to answer that question, but then you also have to calibrate your model to answer that question, because your model will have uncertainty in it. You want to make sure that you reduce the uncertainty in the, like, neighborhood of the management question you're trying to answer. And so by going in and saying, hey, let's make sure we're getting the flow splits right, because the sediment splits are going to be important, is like applying that principle of making of reducing your uncertainty in the places where the management question is important. Um, then he had sediment data. Um, he has actually has some ISDOT. They come out in a boat and they measure bed load um, by taking repeated bathymetries. Um, and then the USGS had some excellent uh, sediment data. And you can see that uh, we have uh, the 1D calibration, Alex built a 1D model of this, and the 1D calibration is on the upper envelope, which is not terribly uncommon. Um, and, uh, and then the, uh, the total load 2D calibration. And so we just used, the 1D model was calibrated. And so we used the 1D calibrated data. Um, in this system, sediment, uh, this, this system tends to coarsen with flow. Um, you know, uh, rivers sometimes get, the, the sediment load gets coarser. Sometimes the sediment get, load gets finer with flow. I have a paper on this. this is one of my big questions is like, why? Um, but uh, in this case, it coarsens with flow. And so we're not only going to just put in the flow load, but you actually have to put in the grain classes for each flow load pair. And so um, this, Alex had enough data that we could actually um, quantify that, and it's going to coarsen with flow. This is the problematic point. This is where the uh, Chippewa delivers um, sediment into the river and uh, to the point that it impinges navigation. And we've reproduced the flow field. We've reproduced um, concentrations. Um, we are still about 50% off with mass deposition. Um, it, was a, it was a pilot RSM project. Um, we didn't get all the way there, but, it, uh, but we're depositing sediment in the right place at the, same, at the right order of magnitude. And um, we will revisit this to, uh, to, to get that right. One of the cool things is he has these dredging polygons. Um, and so one of the things that we're doing in RAS is we're giving the ability to add these dredging polygons. Now, hopefully this year we'll let you dredge them. Um, that we, uh, we have some funding from um, SAD, actually through Brazil, um, to add dredging, to actually go in and add some dredging events to these polygons. But the other thing that we're working on is um, conceptualizing, actually, um, being able to quantify bed change by the dredging polygons, because that's what a lot of folks are, that's what a lot of folks are bringing to the table right now. There's an RSM database of dredging polygons, um, and so, and then this is the, uh, but he, he had actual um, dredge volumes from there, which we compared to the deposition um, to, uh, to do our calibration. Finally, uh, this, this is the Mississippi River. Um, this was the first large scale um, uh, 2D sediment model. Um, this is a stretch of the Mississippi in the St. Louis district. And uh, it's, about a, it's about a 13 mile stretch. Um, which I know we're not talking, it's not 500, uh, but uh, this, this is a pretty beefy model, particularly because it has all of these 
um, navigation structures that we're trying to resolve in high fidelity. And so our cell size is really um, limited by the navigation structures themselves. We went in and uh, um, defined these, uh, the navigation structures as break lines um, so that we would, you know, so that the cell faces would align with them and we would capture that high ground precisely. Uh, you know, the, uh, the St. Louis district famously has these chevrons um, that we also had to, uh, to get with our break lines. And then uh, we did two hydraulic calibrations uh, one for high flow and one for low flow. Um, at, for, at, they're both temporal calibrations. And then Alec added sediment to the model. And uh, you know, now we're back to comparing two 2D maps, right? You look at that, that position's in the right place. It's at approximately the right order of magnitude. Um, we're happy with this result. You know, we're scouring, we're scouring um, at the edge of the, the, uh, the structures. Um, we're depositing behind the structures at approximately the right order of magnitude. And, uh, and so this is kind of our larger scale application. All right, so that is a little overview of what the model can do.